So good morning. Welcome to my talk. My name is Alan Wang, and I'm with the Netflix real-time data infrastructure team. So today, my talk will be focusing on external monitoring and the tracing system that we have developed in Netflix to improve our production readiness for our streaming data infrastructure. So today, when I look back, one thing strikes me is that the tools that we have developed share one common theme, and that is they provide powerful observations made from outside of our core system. So you may be wondering, what's so special about observing from outside? Well, let me first talk about a situation that may sound familiar to many of you. So you wake up at night due to a pager duty call, and you realize that the reason that you are waking up is just because of a latency spike on one of your dependency service. So you keep wondering why the guys who are responsible for that service are not the first one to wake up so that they can fix their issue and I can have a good night of sleep. Well, the truth is, they may not have the same insight as you do. Their dashboard may look perfect normal, but it doesn't matter, right? In a distributed system, the lightness of the service totally depends on the observations made from outside. So here is another example. So this is how the first finding of black hole was confirmed. So black hole, as the name stands, is invisible. So in order for scientists to find a black hole, they have to observe objects around it. So in this case, scientists found a star called Cygnus X1. And there's one interesting fact about this star. So it changes color from red to blue and blue to red periodically. So if you still remember physics, that actually matches the description of Doppler effect. So when the, com when the object comes towards you and the object move away from you, its wavelength will change. So this star, Cygnus X1, must be moving towards Earth and moving away from the Earth um, periodically. A natural explanation of that behavior is that it's actually circling something, right? So what is circling? It is something invisible, and scientists was able to calculate the mass of this invisible object given the location of the star. And the, mass, and the mass actually matches the criteria of a black hole. So this is how the conclusion was made that this invisible object was probably a black hole. So this story tells us how powerful external observation is. And I would argue that this might be the only way for you to find something invisible in your system. And next, I will share our vision to production readiness. So our vision maps into four levels of satisfactions. So you start with the basics, and once you satisfy your basic needs, you start to go up and for more advanced needs. So at the bottom, we have observability. So you should have clear insights to your product. And you should share your insights with your customers to earn their trust. Without observability, nothing works. And if you feel that you are short of ideas of how to improve your production readiness, I definitely recommend to start with observability. So once you have achieved observability, the next step will be availability. So that means you want your product to be 
available and reliable to your users most of the time. So for our streaming data infrastructure, that means we should make sure that the data keeps flowing end to end in our system without interruption. So once you have achieved availability, you should look into operability. Having a pro great product doesn't mean that you have to be burned out for operations. So for most of the issues, you should have simple and repeatable processes to deal with them, and most of the operations should be automated. So at Netflix, our streaming data infrastructure handles about 1,000 streams and data pipelines. So without operability, things will be totally untenable. So once you have satisfied with operability, availability, and observability, here comes the crown jewel, data quality. So here you want to establish some key indicators for your data quality, and maybe some also enforceable SLOs. And for this talk, I'll be focusing on data transport quality, and specifically data loss rate, duplicate rate, and end-to-end -end latency. To make sense of my talk, I would like to share the architecture of our streaming data infrastructure at Netflix. So on the left side, we have event producers. And they send events to a set of Kafka clusters, which we call fronting Kafka clusters. And as you can see on this picture, we use Flink for stream processing. So once the data get into fronting Kafka cluster, they are consumed by a set of stream processing jobs which operate on the infrastructure level. And those stream processing jobs are also called routers in our infrastructure. And they do some simple ETL, like projection and filtering. And once the data is processed, they'll be sent to downstream syncs, including S3, Elasticsearch, and another set of Kafka cluster, which we call consumer Kafka clusters. And there, data will be consumed by our customers' streaming processing job and other Kafka consumers. So now that we have covered our vision, our principle of external observation, and our architecture, let's start with the basics. How we have improved observability with our Kafka broker and consumer monitoring. So as you can see on the previous architectural chart, Kafka plays a vital role in our infrastructure. So it's very important to make sure the Kafka is operational, is healthy. So let's say you create a Kafka cluster and all the internal metrics looks normal to you. Are you confident enough to put, put, uh, to put production traffic on it? <coughs> well, the Kafka cluster is not um, operational until you can produce message to it and consume, consume message from it. So we come up with a simple idea of creating an external service that constantly send hard beating messages to the Kafka cluster and at the same time consume those messages. And we do a little bit of analytical work here also. We will, we will make sure that the messages that it produces matches the messages it has consumed. So by doing that, we, have, we can gain confidence that the Kafka cluster is truly operational. Another important functionality we do in this external monitoring service is to monitor the Kafka metadata. And we do this in two ways. We watch the Zookeeper nodes and look for its metadata. And we monitor the IRSR state in Zookeeper as well. At the same time, this, extra, this external monitoring service will also talk to brokers to get the metadata directly. 
And we try to match the metadata we get from brokers versus the metadata we get from the zookeeper to make sure they match. And if there's a mismatch, usually it's an indication that some kind of network partitioning has happened. So either the broker cannot talk to the zookeeper or the broker cannot, to, cannot connect to the rest of the, the Kafka clusters. So at that time, you need to enable some automated actions. For example, you should maybe restart the JVM of your Kafka broker or just completely replace that broker. Another important functionality that we do in this um, monitoring service is to monitor the consumer and the streaming jobs. So Kafka consumers will periodically commit its offset to the Kafka cluster. So the committed consumer offset becomes a vital sign to tell if the consumer is healthy. So from monitoring the committed offset, we can derive the consumer lag as well as to get a signal of whether the consumer has been completely stuck. So what we do here is we fetch the log end offsets from the Kafka cluster, and we also fetch the committed consumer set, uh, offsets from the Kafka cluster. And we do a little you know, simple calculation to know the consumer lag, which is the log end offsets minus the committed offsets for any topic partition. Another signal that we try to derive is whether the consumer is completely stuck. So by, we, we do this by observing the continued staleness of the committed consumer offset in a given window. So let's say we set this window to be three minutes, as I've shown in this example. In the first three minutes, the committed consumer, set, consumer offset has not been changed. It has been you know, all three, while the log n offset has been making some progress. So at the fourth minute, upon observing you know, the consumer offset is still unchanged, we will declare this consumer to be stuck. And at the fifth minute, we noticed an advancement of the committed consumer offset. So we will just clear that stuck signal. And we do provide rest endpoints for this monitoring service. And we expose the consumer lag information as well as the broker metadata information. So by doing this, we can build a lot of useful automations on top of those. So if you are familiar with Kafka, you may notice that Kafka already provides internal metrics for consumer lag. So you may, you may be asking, you know, why bother creating your own service to monitor the consumer lag? Well, these internal metrics works well uh, until the consumer stops polling or completely crash. And at that time, this metric may, may become completely stale or be dropped from the metric system. And at that point, it will be very confusing and misleading. And the second reason that we want to have this service is that we can easily derive the stock signal because purely relying on the Kafka's internal metric, there's no way that you can get that stock signal. Raise your hand if you know this song. Oh, only one? I can't believe it. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this song is you know, kind of rosy. Uh, and I, when, I, when I wrote my slides, but it's kind of stuck in my head because it actually reflects the feeling that we have towards our stock consumer alert. And it's always a mix of love and hate. And I'll explain why. So first, the love. Well, getting this stock consumer alert can help us to catch all kinds of issues whether it's internal or external to our system. And it dramatically improves our service quality. So if you have a streaming data service, the last thing that you want to have is your customer comes to you to complain about their job getting stuck, and you have no idea about it. 
So this stock consumer alert help us to avoid this kind of embarrassment. And it also help us to earn the customer's trust. So why the hate? Well, it is truly a nightmare for us. So since the creation of this alert, it immediately becomes the number one wake up calls from PagerDuty. And it's actually very difficult to debug. And there are so many possibilities that, that can cause a consumer getting stuck. So here, um, I listed some of the possible causes for getting this uh, consumer stock alert. And you can see it ranges from source, infrastructure, sync, and processors. And it may be even caused by problems in committing offset. So imagine that you wake up at night and you are facing so many possibilities to deal with. So to help us to truly identify the cause of consumer getting stuck, we need to further look into debugging logs and possibly try to find some metrics. And in some cases, after we identify some pattern or some failure modes, we will create additional logging or additional metrics so that next time we know where to look for. But the biggest help comes from auto remediations. So in the next section, I'm going to talk about how auto mediations help us to improve the operability and availability in our data infrastructure. So the first, first thing that we have noticed is that for a stateless streaming job, simply relaunching the job upon getting this stock consumer alert, having a good chance uh, to actually getting that consumer out of the stock state. So we create this tool called First Responder. So as the name implies, it will automatically relaunch a status job upon getting the first consumer stock alert. And of course, uh, we'll still go investigate the root cause afterwards. But, uh, and, and also, when the fixed relaunch does not fix the problem, the further relaunch will be suppressed. And here is the screenshot of the first responder in action. So as you can see, it indeed saved the night for a couple of times for us. And the second useful automations that we derive from our consumer lag monitoring is streaming jobs auto skating. So as you can see, for most of our streams, their traffic fluctuates on a daily basis. So it is very inefficient to use a fixed capacity for our streaming jobs. But without auto skating, all we can do initially is to pin our capacity high. But even if we pin our capacity high, sometimes it's still not sufficient because the traffic can grow organically. So on this graph, the gray area designates the traffic volume and the red line designates the consumer lag. So you can see, after the traffic increase uh, exceeds a certain threshold, the consumer lag will increase dramatically. And only after this peak hour is over, then the lag can disappear, and the job can finally catch up. So the direct impact of this is that the customer will see increased latency at peak hours. So in order to get rid of this catch-up game, we want to do auto-skating. And the idea of auto-skating is, is this. For example, you notice a lag for your streaming job and you want to get rid of it in 15 minutes. So you need to calculate the new capacity needed for the job. So once you, you calculate, uh, so once you calculate the new capacity, you need to relaunch the job. And then the job relaunch will take about two minutes. So you have 30 minutes left to do the actual catch up. So your first thing you need to figure out is the expected incoming events in the 15 minutes time frame. So these are the new events coming into the pipeline. And you also need to know the consumer lag. You add them together to get 
the number of total events that you'll be processing in this 15 minutes. And you divide that total events by the catch-up time, you'll get the target rate. Once you know the target rate, it's very easy to figure out the new expected capacity for your job. And one thing we need to um, get uh, in order to make this work is to predicting the future workload. So what we, what we do here is, why, what we try, uh, is we try to fit the quadratic regression on our traffic curve. And if it turns out that this error is too large, we'll just go back to linear regression. And of course, this sounds like overly simplified. And in practice, we do find that this calculation does not cover all cases, and there's a lot of room for improvement. But at least, it gave us a head start for us to do auto scaling so that we can save the cost and reduce the operational burdens. So this is a screenshot showing the streaming jobs auto scaling in action. So on the upper part of the graph, you can see the traffic volume. But on the lower part, uh, that's the, the number containers needed for that streaming jobs. And basically, that translates to, translates to the resource and the capacity of the job. As you can see, the number of containers uh, actually scale up and down quite nicely according to the traffic pattern. So finally, um, we you know, covered the operability, availability, and observability. And then we can get into the discussion of data quality. And here, I want to talk about how we used um, loss detection to be able to find the loss messages and even auto-recover those messages to improve our data quality. And as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the talk, I'll be focusing on the data transport, uh, trans data transport quality here, which is the loss, loss rate, um, duplicate rate, and end-to-end -end latency. So let's look into data loss detection in details. I have seen in several places where people rely on count to detect loss. And the idea is simple. So you first count the number of messages sent by your producer in a time frame. And you also count the number of messages received by your consumer in the same time frame. And you try to compare your received count and the sent count. But the question is, let's say if your received count is always greater than the sent count, are you confident that you deliver, you deliver every message? Well, the answer is no, because in the received count, there's probably some duplicates. And the duplicates can be caused by producer doing retries under the hood, which you cannot account for. Or the consumer may have sometimes reset its offset to an earlier position. And another problem with the count is that the aggregation is tricky. Are we talking about event time or processing time? And how do we handle the late arrivals of the message? And the third reason that I don't like using count is that the identification of the messages is lost in aggregation. So even if you can detect count, there's no way that you can recover your loss. So we decided to turn to a widely accepted concept in microservice world, which is tracing. So the basic idea is we want to trace the data as they move along in the pipeline. And we will also generate traces as point of interest. So at a data ingestion point, we want to determine if we want to trace a particular message by random sampling. And this sampling rate is configurable. So if you configure your sampling rate to be 100%, that just means you want to trace every single message. And so once we gather those traces, we want to analyze, I want, we want to analyze the traces externally. But we are also doing quite differently from the tracing in microservice world. Our emphasis here is on data loss, 
data loss detection. We want to identify lost messages and be able to automatically recover those lost messages. It is not about creating the call graph because we already have the data leakage information from our control plane or our management service. So instead, we want to leverage the data lineage information to derive the data loss information. So in other words, we know the call graph, but we want to figure out who doesn't make that call. So we created our, our tracing system called Inca. And Inca is a famous trail, a mountain trail in um, South America. It is worth noting that we typically use mountain names uh, in our, for our, we typically use mountain names for our services in our streaming data infrastructure. And Inca is a you know, clear exception from that naming convention. But you can figure out that we want to rely on Inca to reach higher ground. So this is how we do tracing. Assuming you have a typical data pipeline where you have your event producer produce messages to a Kafka cluster A, and the message is consumed by your stream processing job. And let's assume it will do some simple enrichment to, and keep the same identity of the message. And then the final message will be produced to a cluster B. So we want to keep using Kafka for our tracing, and we create a dedicated Kafka cluster to hold all the trace messages. So when the producer sends the message with ID 0001 to Kafka cluster A, it will at the same time send a trace message to the tracing cluster. And the trace message will have the message ID, which is the same as the original message ID, and it will have the type of sent and remote location being A, and the offset of that message. And same as the uh, streaming processing jobs. Upon receiving the message of ID 0001, it will send a trace to the, Kafka uh, to the tracing Kafka cluster with the same ID and with the type being received and remote location being A. Once the processing is done and the final message is produced, to the Kafka cluster B, another trace message will be generated. And this time, it will have the same ID and the type being sent and the remote location being B. So now we gathered all our trace messages in our Kafka cluster and we want to do stream, stream processing for those messages to get real time results because we don't want to wait for hours or days to detect a loss. We want to detect loss immediately within minutes. So the first thing that the job does is do a key by the trace ID or, this, or the same as message ID. So by doing this, you can imagine that a lot of messages are being shuffled you know, to different places. And the traces for the same message will be shuffled to the same task. So now that we have access to all the trace, trace messages for, the, uh, for all the traces of the same message in one place. And that can actually give us tremendous insights to see what's going on there. So if, if we find that, let's say one trace is missing for a given location and a given action type, we can claim that the message is lost there. And if we received more than one traces, for a certain location and certain action type, we can claim duplicates. And same as latency, we can easily calculate, calculate the latency for any data hop using the timestamp in the traces. But we immediately face a challenge. So in the streaming processing job, how long we should be waiting for the trace to arrive? Because trace arrival time is unpredictable in our system. It is not unusual because it actually matches the behavior of messages flowing in our data system. While most of the messages are delivered end to end within a few seconds, there are messages that can take hours um, to be delivered. 
And this is just caused by, you know, the streaming jog is, is uh, severely lagging behind. So as I mentioned before, we use Flink for stream processing. But in Flink, it's very hard to find a built-in a built window function that can efficiently deal with this kind of long tail. So we decided to use Flink's custom trigger with global window. What it is essentially translates to is that we want to take complete control of how long to wait and what actions to, and what actions to take after the wait is over. But we still face that challenge of you know, how long to wait. If we wait too long, but the message is already lost, then we are just wasting resources and the job will become unscalable. If you wait too short, the system may generate a lot of force alarms. Because if we, um, if we uh, prematurely you know, declare a message loss, the force alarm will, will definitely arrive because the actual message has not been arrived yet and we just declare loss at that time. So it's like you know, waiting a train that's uh, not always sticking to its schedule. When you rush to the platform and you found the train's not there, you will face the dilemma of whether to wait or not. And if you choose to wait, you might be keep wondering if you are waiting for a train that will never arrive. So to solve that problem, we need to some external inputs. And we decided to turn to our old friends, committed consumer offset. So recall that in our trace messages, we actually record the actual offset of the message. So what we can do here is we can compare the committed offset versus the message offset. So if the committed offset is greater than the message offset, but we don't have the trace, that means the message is probably lost. So here, I'm showing you the simplified logic of our stream processing job. And it always starts with some kind of event. So the event can be in the, a trace is received or a timer has been triggered. And at that time, we will check if all expected traces has been received for that message. And if, it's, if we do receive all the traces, we will report good. And if not, we will compare the committed offset versus the message offset. And if the committed offset is greater than the message offset, we'll report loss, as I, plain, as I explained in the previous slide. And if not, that just means the consumer is still trying to catch up. And at that time, we'll just set a new timer and keep waiting. So here is the complete picture for our tracing system, Inca. So the data producers and the processors will constantly send us all kinds of trace messages to our dedicated Kafka cluster for tracing. And we have our event, we have our stream processing jobs that consume from those uh, trace messages from Kafka cluster. And it will also get external input from our control plane and Kafka clusters. It will get the data lineage information from our control plane so that we can figure out what are the expected traces for any message. And it will get the committed offset from the Kafka cluster so we will know how long to wait for the trace messages. And after the processing is done, it will produce its final outputs to two locations. So it will produce the loss rate, duplicate rate, and latency metrics to our telemetry system called ATLAS. And most importantly, it will publish the identity of the lost messages to a Kafka topic. So that's where our consumer or our customer can subscribe to that lost message Kafka topic and apply their own auto recovery. So you might be asking, you know, those trace messages are also Kafka messages and can be lost, right? The answer is definitely yes. And we understand that a lost trace can lead to false alarms or some inaccuracy in our analysis. 
But I also want to argue that to validate your streaming data, there's no perfect solution that, that can give you 100% you know, confidence of, or 100% accuracy. You, you'll probably end up having to have multiple data validation solutions altogether to give you, you know, the best confidence that you can have. And tracing is just one of those data validation solutions. That being said, we do maximize the uh, delivery guarantee for our traces. For example, we have a dedicated uh, tracing Kafka cluster, and it uses a very durable AWS EBS. And finally, let's say a false alarm is generated due to a lost trace. It is still okay. So one solution for getting this kind of force alarms due to lost, uh, lost trace is that you apply your auto recovery anyway. Because for at least once delivery, this may introduce um, a little bit of duplicates. But given the at least one semantic, this is totally acceptable, given that our loss rate for the traces is very, very low. Now you might be wondering, now you have this you know, wonderful tracing system. What kind of problem have you detected? Well, we have detected three major categories of uh, data loss. So the first one, uh, the first category is caused by uh, less durable configurations. And this is understandable because when we initially create our Kafka cluster and create our, and configure our streams, we have to take into account of cost, availability, and durability, and balance them out. So we may end up choosing a less you know, durable configuration for saving cost. For example, if you have a Kafka topic with replication factor of two, and producer x equals one, naturally, this might lead to you know, a tiny bit of message losses. It can happen you know, at some uh, extreme cases at, uh, due to, you know, it can happen at some edge cases at replication, especially when there's a change of leader in the partition. And the second major category that we found for data loss is some extreme situations. Let's say you have a Kafka topic with a replication factor of nine, but you just happen to lose all nine of your replicas. Um, that's very unfortunate, but it can happen. But in one interesting case, we found that a partition leader has a significant clock drift, and that leads to unexpected log truncation happening at unexpected time. And luckily, we have the tracing in place at the time, and we were able to detect the message loss caused by this unexpected uh, log truncation. And the third major category for the data loss is actually human factors. So these are human errors, code errors, or operation errors. So I can give you one example. Um, in our deployment tool, we have a design flaw where in some rare cases, it can assign the same consumer ID to two different stream processing jobs. So those two stream processing jobs can step on each other's toe when they restart. So what happens is when one job shuts down, it will commit its last, off, uh, last offset to the Kafka cluster. And when it comes back again, it tries to fetch the last committed offset. But what it gets is somebody else committed offset. So it will naturally lead to message loss. And I want to point out that for the second and third category, it can happen regardless how durable your Kafka configuration is. And I would even argue that it can happen for any system regardless how strong their delivery guarantee is. So that leads me to think that detecting message loss is not that different from finding a black hole. So as you recall in my, the beginning of my talk, to find a black hole, 
you have to observe objects around it. So in this case, the black hole is the Kafka broker with a bad hardware that eats our messages. And what are the objects around it? The producers and consumers. So if you just look at your Kafka broker, there's no way that you can find that it's a losing message. But if you look at the producer and consumer and the traces that they generate, it's very easy to figure out um, that some message has been lost. So this is the takeaway of my talk. We, start, we started with observability, where we used Kafka broker and consumer monitoring to, to improve our observability. And on top of that, we created auto remediations to help improve our operability and availability. And specifically, we use a first responder to automatically relaunch our stateless stops once, uh, once it gets the stock state. And also, we use auto scaling to help us to efficiently re uh, use our resources while keeping the consumer lag at minimal level. And finally, we use message tracing to help us detect message loss and auto recover them to improve our data quality. And again, I would like everybody to remember the power of external observation. And I hope that someday you can use that to find your own black hole. So by the way, I have a completed blog post for our message tracing system in Netflix tech blog. So check it out if you are interested. And if you are interested to tackle with problems in the real-time infrastructure, we are hiring, and welcome to join us. Thank you.